Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby storm with his hand Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels try And when you kiss your little baby You kiss the face of God Oh Mary Our lesson tonight will be presented by our pastor, Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. Amen. I give reverence to God and thank him for another day. Thank him for this season that we're in. We celebrate the birth of Christ and we esteem him as being the reason for all of the celebrations that we are able to enjoy through Christ Amen. Jesus. To our superintendent, Deacon William Collins, and to our teachers, Bless all of you who are joining us tonight, it is a blessing for us to come together and to study God's word, justice and deliverance. And, you know, whenever the justice of God is manifested, there's going to be some deliverance, which that means you got to be on the right side of justice <laughs> because justice can bring wrath or destruction, maybe I use that word, destruction or deliverance. Amen. That's that's what the justice of God is going to bring. It's all going to be connected to your relationship with God. We're going to look at the prophecy and the place indicated and the prophet identified. We're going to look at the portrayals, punishment for foes, power to accomplish protection for his people and the pursuit of his enemies. And finally, we're going to look at promises and end of affliction and peace for his people. It's been a while since we've had a lesson out of the book of Nahum. Uh, Nahum uh, is one of those prophets that, are ch that is charged with the responsibility of encouraging of the children of Israel. And not his is not really a great prophecy of condemnation of Israel as much as a condemnation of their enemies, and in particular tonight, Nineveh. Uh, in this in historical setting, uh, we have to understand that it's a message of hope for Judah. Even so only one historical event is cited in the book's three chapters. We know that those that trust in God should be people of hope. We believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So Nahum is dealing during the time of the reign of the Assyrians and Nineveh is one of the great nations. And even though almost a hundred years prior, God had sent Nineveh this great message of prophetic preaching through Jonah. And even though they repented then, they reverted back to their old ways 
And of course, that ultimately uh, brought their end and that's destruction. Nineveh hit its peak in power as assured by Nepal's capital in the mid 17th century BC, just before the destruction. Following uh, Ashura by Nepal's death, kingdoms that had come under Assyrian control rebel. Among these were the Babylonians and the Medes, and their armies came together to sack Nineveh, 612 BC, following the, this Babylonian displaced Assyria as the major power in the regions. But now the prophecy of Nahum, the burden, the, the, let me just say this to you. Uh, when you are given a message that must be delivered or that you should deliver, it can be a burden. It can be a burden. Um, I tell people part of the things I, I dislike about being in management was having to terminate people. I did not care for that. I knew it was necessary. I knew it was a part of the package, but I didn't like terminating people. And when I was given directives of terminating somebody, it became a burden to me. It became a burden until I, of course, I did it. I had to do it. I, I always share the story of when I was managing the shoe department that uh, I had one full-time employee and several part-time employees and the uh, Boss came to me and said, he said, Jimmy, we only have room um, in the next upcoming year for one full-time person in that department, and that's going to be you as the manager. I said, okay. He said, so you're going to have to tell this other full-time person that uh, we're going to have to let him go. And of all season, it was the season that we're into right now. It was this holiday season, and I knew a young man had three kids and a young wife and and you know he was trying to get himself together so the boss asked me on tuesday after he had told me that at the meeting on monday he said have you talked to his, and he gave called his name i said no i haven't i said i promise you i'm gonna get that done and i couldn't bring myself to do it that tuesday and so he saw me wednesday he said jimmy have you talked no 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 but it's i'm, I'm gonna get it done before the day is out. Thursday, he called me up to his office. He said, have you talked to us? I said, no, I, I, I'm going to do it. I know I told you that Tuesday, but I'm going to do it. He said, well, here's the deal. I got place, I got on the schedule, room for one full-time employee. He said, and either he go or you go. It made my burden a little bit lighter. <laughs> oh no <laughs> I went down and I told him I said man I got bad news <laughs> <laughs> I said all that to let you know that, that sometimes delivering messages and, and, and carrying out a prophecy can be a burden oh yeah amen it, it, it can weigh on you and mm -hmm. let me tell you what weighs on you even more if you don't do it, uh, yeah. then that accountability comes in. Mm. So uh, uh, prophets often began their prophecies using the word uh, translated burden. And the same word is translated prophecy. And the prophecy that follows is often one of judgment. That is the case here. This is a weighty call. It's not. Is not a trivial matter. It's not a light matter. The city of Nineveh was located on the Tigris River, site of the present day Mosul, Iraq. Nineveh was first mentioned in the Bible when the descendants of Noah's son, Ham, built it. So we won't get into the black history today. Y'all know it's hard for me to stay away from it. Uh, but you all know who Ham was the father of, don't you? Mm. Amen. I'll let y'all go and think about that. 
uh, prophet identified the book of the vision of Nahum the El Koshite. The vision. Uh, he he that 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 name El Koshite just means he was from a town called El Kosh. The vision is another way to refer to the prophecy being revealed in this book. The same Hebrew word can also be translated revelation, which emphasizes that God provided both the experience and the wisdom to understand its significance. Nahum name means repentance or compassion. Amen. He is the only person in the Old Testament with that name. And it's not the name, Nahum named in Jesus' genealogy. Nahum did not provide the names of his ancestors, only that he was from the town of Elkosh. Four places carried that name. Two in Galilee, uh, including the, the town called Capernaum, which means, by definition, town or village of Nahum, Capernaum, <laughs> and one near Jerusalem. Jonah and Nahum are the two Old Testament prophets whose prophecies focus on the coming judgment on Nineveh. Nahum's prophets Prophecy differs from Jonah's in two key ways. Nahum was told to preach to Judah about Nineveh. Not in Nineveh itself, but among the people of Judah. And Nahum's prophecy was fulfilled. Jonah's was unfulfilled because God chose mercy over judgment when the people repented. So Jonah preached to Nineveh about Judah. And Nahum preached to Judah about Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to deal with him. Zephaniah, a contemporary of Nahum, also named Nineveh in the context of judgment coming to all of Assyria. Verse 2 said, God is jealous. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Should this verse should this verse awaken some people today okay. should should this verse should. God is jealous which means what he said and he said it himself thou shalt have no other God before me what about all of these apostates And many of them are right in the church who have other gods. The Lord revengeth. And we know we, we tell people don't try to take revenge because God said vengeance is mine. Amen. The Lord revengeth and is furious. Amen. I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't like to get no whooping when daddy was really mad. He mad at somebody else. <laughs> but he promised me a whooping. And while he whooping me, he talked thinking about what there's a way. Don't, don't, don't put my punishment. Don't get mine mixed up with him. But but God can be furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And let me say this to you all. You you faithful believers, you faithful saints, you dedicated workers for the Lord. Don't, don't get it twisted. God sees everything that is being done against his people 
against his work and against his word. You see everything. And right now, we have not seen personally this furious revenge. God reserves wrath for his enemies. We should take care to understand what it means for the Lord to be jealous. God's jealousy is not like that of a boy who has a fit if he see his girlfriend flirting with someone else. The biblical concept of jealousy when applied to God indicates a profound sense of caring and commitment. This is even more apparent where a word in the original language is translated jealousy in one passage, but zeal in another. When we see the overlap of the meaning is affirmed in English by dictionary entry that offers one meaning of jealousy as zealous vigilance. Zealous vigilance. The common idea is one of fervency. In this verse, God's jealousy is more closely linked to his protecting his people from violence and oppression than often results when hostile nations worship violent and oppressive false gods. And let me say this, we need God's protection because the enemy of the kingdom of God can be violent and oppressive. One of the names mentioned, not mentioned in this text, but mentioned quite often, of course, with Hezekiah in the book of Isaiah was Sennacherib who captured many cities in Judah. So the Lord protecting both his name and his people said to Hezekiah through Isaiah, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of him. And as a result, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers died in one night. Second Kings chapter 18, Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. Repetition in Hebrew prophecy, which was often written as poetry, serves to emphasize the point that is being made. So God's furious, God is wrathful, becomes more frightening and immediate through Nahum's insistence that God will act out of his righteous rage. And I just believe that we set ourselves up as a nation to see the righteous rage of God. For we are a nation that has the audacity to call ourselves a nation of God-fearing and God-loving people. The audacity to write on our money, in God we trust. When really we trust in the money, not in God. The wrath. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We, we need to know that God can be wrathful. God can be so wrathful, he'll have you praying for your enemies. Lord, help him. <laughs> Lord, for, have mercy on him. But God can be so wrathful. And let me just say this. Nobody knows how much God has taken off you before God get on you. <laughs> That's just something to think about. Have you ever wondered why the Bible describes the Lord as a jealous God? It really means he is a protective and passionate God. He doesn't sit passively 
on his throne. Sin rouses God's righteous indignation, but not because he hates us. On the contrary, he loves us too much to sit by idly when out of control wickedness threatens our relationship with him. And you may not know it, and I believe you do know it. We are witnessing, we are witnessing among us out of control wickedness. It's out of control, y'all. It's out of control. And it threatens our relationship with God. I'm glad our Heavenly Father isn't apathetic, indifferent, unemotional about us. I'm glad that he loves us so much that he loves us so much. You know what he said to Judah? He said, I have given nations for you. I've gone to war for you. I have destroyed nations for you. And that's not the words from an apathetic, indifferent, unemotional God. And a lot of people don't like you to attach emotion to God. But God has said that he is wrathful against the wicked. Verse 3 says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Now we know that there is thrown in here some anthropomorphism. We know God don't really have feet and all of that, but it is trying to paint a picture for us of just how our God responds and deals with ultimately his enemies. If the nation of Assyria deserved to be punished, why had God not done something earlier? It tells you right in there. The Lord is slow to anger. Amen. Sometimes we, we wish you would get mad or quicker in dealing with our adversaries. But then there are times that we applaud the fact that I'm glad God waited on me. <laughs> so we, we got a, 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 a two-sided coin. I'm glad that God is slow to anger. I'm glad that God is patient. God waits patiently because he wants everyone to repent. He does not wish for anyone to perish according to 2 Peter 3 and 9. God does not react in haste. God's patience does have its limits. And when his patience his patience ends. He still has the power to hold the wicked accountable. The people in Noah's day had gone too far from God and acted wickedly. So God sent the flood, having promised never to destroy the whole world with water again. God still reserved the right to act in judgment. And although God acts as a judge, this verse describes him as more of a righteous warrior. Unlike human fighters, he has all of nature at his command. He has all of nature he can use as weapons. And you don't know how God's going to work. And you don't know what God's going to use. He talked to you about the whirlwind forms in the sky and reaches on earth. The storm can yield thunder and lightning and hail and destructive rains and more. The clouds parallel. 
these terms and encompasses weather more generally. Not only does God command these, but they are at, they are as distressing to him as the dust that kicks up. And he walks in the heavens. That is to say, our God is awesome. Even dust can serve his purposes as seen in the plague of boils that resulted from Moses' obeying God's command. Nahum 1, 4, and 5 continues to describe God's power in terms, his authority over the forces and features of our world. God has used bees. He used, you know, flies. He used rain. He used mud. God got so many things at his disposal that our enemies and the enemies of his work and the enemies of his church in trouble. That world system that right now has organized itself. Those movements in America that have organized themselves against God and against the people of God and against the word of God, they're going to have to deal with the vengeance and the wrath of God. Verse 6 says, who can stand before his indignation? Or who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Read the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. See, didn't God throw some fiery rocks at him? And, and I like to say, he didn't send them to hell. He sent hell to them. And the aftermath was condemnation. The recognition of the Lord's power caused Nahum to ask two rhetorical questions. These ask the same thing and in doing so emphasize the impossibility of the answer. No one can withstand God's indignation and the fierceness of his anger. No person and no nation, not even the strongest of the strongest will has the ability to resist God. I'm strong. I can stand against anything, anybody, and any God. If he only knew. God's fury uh, writer says it's like a volcano. Lava like fire is poured out. The eruption sends rocks into the air. Nothing in the path of the volcano or the Lord in his righteous anger can survive. And I'm a Star Trek fan. I'm a Trekkie. And as the board says, Resistance is futile. You can't resist and win because the, the unlimited power of God is going to conquer every time. Protection for his people. Verse 7 says, the Lord is good. Now, <laughs> we just got through hearing Nahum talk about how vengeance and how furious and 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 how God but then the same God the Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knoweth them that trust in him all of God's many attributes are tempted are tempered ready by the fact that he is good he creates good things he gives good gifts. Those who trust him experience his goodness in protection from harm. The phrase he knoweth them anticipates Jesus' self-disclosure that he is the good shepherd 
who knows his sheep. And guess what else he said? And my sheep know my voice. On the Lord as a stronghold, we look at Psalms 31 and 2. Our God is an awesome God. Verse 8 says, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Nahum often used poetic imagery to describe the destruction of Nineveh, but two factors here were literally fulfilled. The Tigris River ran along the western side of Nineveh, and a, and a tributary from the east joined it there. A severe flooding in both rivers at once would be too much for the foundation of the mighty city. During the Babylonian siege of Nineveh, a great flood occurred that damaged the walls of the city that helped to bring about the end of the great city. And that's Nahum chapter two, verses six and eight. After that, the figurative flood of Babylon and the Medes took the city. Many ancient cities suffered, captured, and destruction. And new cities were built on top of the ruins, but Nineveh was never rebuilt. Figuratively, darkness also overwhelmed Nineveh. There's no indication that God used the same darkness in Nineveh that he chose in Egypt. Rather, the fate of the city was similar to what was believed of a dead person existing in some dark place, never to be offered opportunity to enter God's presence. Woo! Still darkness playing a part in releasing God's people from oppression is pregnant. Verse 12a, thus said the Lord, though they be quiet and like wise many yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through thus saith the Lord is a phrase used hundreds of times in the Old Testament to introduce a prophecy given by Nineveh would happen as surely as if it had already happened the prophecy was entirely trustworthy. Why? Because thus saith the Lord. Though they be quiet, speaks to serenity as a result of political alliance and national strength. But in this case, the Ninevites might combine with their numerical superiority to come create a false sense of security. Let me say this, when God comes after a, an individual or a nation or a city or a movement that is against God. There's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. Uh -huh. Let me tell you, a couple of weeks ago, when tornadoes were dancing, across the Midwest. They really don't know how many. Somebody had estimated 25 across all of the Midwest. And in this one town where the, the whole town was three quarter uh, destroyed, they said, and, and, and one of the uh, rescue people said this, he said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, we walk up to a house and the house was beautiful on the front. He said, we go about back, round back, and it was as if you were on a stage setting out in Hollywood. There was nothing back there. He said, and then a, a whole row of houses would be destroyed. And in the middle of that row, one house would be standing with no damage. With no damage. God is awesome. God is awesome. 
And a lot of times when people are done thing and they're guilty, they get quiet. And they're hoping that they be getting quiet. Don't stop God. Because <laughs> he know what's going on on the inside. Finally, the promise. An end of affliction. You know what Nahum is saying to them? God is sharing all this with you because he wants you to know that he's getting ready to bring you real deliverance. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Now, the subject of God's address changes here from Assyria, represented by Nineveh, to Judah. Assyria, the instrument of God's anger, had gone too far and would be stopped. The Assyrian violence and oppression would be uh, afflict, would not afflict God's people forever. Peace for his people, verse 13, for now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. A wooden yoke was placed on the necks of the animals for pulling heavy loads or plowing. While it was a mere tool on a beast of burden, people were never meant to bear the kind of yoke in the view here. The yoke, therefore, became a symbol of oppression. A Syrian bondage on Judah would end. How would it end? Would they all of a sudden get a surge of power? Would they all of a sudden receive great army support from Egyptians and others? No. God would intervene. Let me just say this to you. Whatever you are bound by, whatever has in some ways afflicted, God can break it. God can set us free. The Lord spoke once again to Nineveh in Nahum 1.14. His declaration left no doubt as to the fate of the city and its false gods. Don't be impressed by the billions of dollars that they are spending to erect great monuments and to erect great uh, groups and organizations. I don't care how beautiful it look. I don't care how much they pay for it. When God get tired of the foolishness and the ungodliness and the wickedness, remember money means something to us. It don't mean nothing to God because he owns everything. God can destroy it. Verse 15, they said, behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. The opening words of this verse are similar to those of Isaiah 52, 7, which itself is quoted in Romans 10, 15. In Isaiah's contact, the good things where the Babylonian exile would end and the people of Judah would be restored to their land. For the apostle Paul, the words of Romans find their ultimate meaning in the march of the news regarding Jesus Christ. For Nahum, the pre-Babylonian Judah, the good news was that Assyria would fall. The church, the people of God, the kingdom of God, the work of God has always faced oppositions. And if the people of God are faithful, God removes and even destroys the opposition. If the people of God are unfaithful, God allows a battle to chastise them. Babylon becomes the arm of God, the belt, the the, the switch, the rod to whip his people back into shape. I, I, I don't know what else. Uh, Coronas is, I believe, one of those powers, but I don't know what else God has in store for us 
when I say us, I mean this world. I'm not just talking about America. But we are, I believe, pushing God to a state of furious wrath by the things that we are embracing, that we are accepting, and even in some churches promoting God said to Solomon, if it wasn't for your daddy, I'd, I'd kill you. Take the kingdom from you for the things that you let go on. There are consequences. Ooh. And I want to be a prophet of doom. I want to be a prophet of truth. There are consequences for all the bad choices that our nation is making, that our people are making. And I'll even go as far as say that our race is making. And, and Nahum and this pre-Babylonian Judah is sharing with them, look what God can do, look what God has done, look how God has destroyed uh, uh, the enemies, the Assyrians. Y'all need to get right. Y'all need to turn around. Verse 15, that publisheth peace. Peace has been a blessing available to the people of the promised land if they remain faithful to the Lord. Y'all keep that in your memory banks. The blessings of God are attached to being and remaining faithful to the Lord. This peace was to include cooperation from the land in agriculture. This peace is victory over foes, but most importantly, God's presence. In short, reversals of the curses found in Genesis 3. This too ultimately was only fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, Judah! Keep thy solemn feasts. Perform thy vows. For the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. What are you saying, Nahum? As a result, Nahum challenged Judah to keep the various feasts prescribed in the law of Moses. The implication is that some type of restriction has hindered the free exercise of worship for the people of God, or more troubling, the people hadn't been very dedicated to the celebrations to begin with and had used foreign interference as an excuse not to perform their vows. The Lord said, I can fix that. I can fix that. Whatever's been keeping you from being who you want to be for me, I can fix that. I'm not going to let them pass through your borders. I'm not going to let them have that influence. With the destruction of the wicked, however, the people would be free once again to choose devotion to God and enjoy the blessings that came with it. The destruction of Nineveh fulfill Nahum's prophecy. The city's destruction was complete and so too was the end of the serious dominance. The pending doom of Nineveh was the greatest part of Nahum's prophecy. But closely related was the word of deliverance for Judah. This comforted a people who had been oppressed by Assyria for decades. Injustice, brothers and sisters, still exists and God still intends to act to bring justice and to deliver his people but he sees the global picture so his timetable differs from what we might desire in his treatment of Assyria he did not act in haste at the right time in God's plan the nation of Assyria came to an end 
It had fulfilled its purpose. God's justice prevailed. God's timing is always perfect. For this reason, we share the love of Jesus, not only as Chris, at Christmas time, but also year round. The gospel truth about Jesus is the reason we have hope of eternal life. And what better news could there be than a future with the Lord in his heaven? Hallelujah. Justice. Justice of God is coming upon the enemies of God and upon the church so that we will fulfill the purpose of God, right. justice and deliverance. If there are no questions, brothers, superintendent, that's my presentation of the lesson. Of Mary, did you know? the grave.